and uh, also <laughs> greeting from sri lanka uh, on behalf yeah. of sri lanka veterinary association we would like to yeah. welcome you all uh, to the third international webinar series and this is our sixth webinar on common uh, emergencies in dogs and cat uh, so i would like to thank uh, dr bimal tenakun for accepting our invitation to talk on this topic as well as he is uh, well known when trained to me in the, we were in the same uh, period of when we do in the did our undergraduate studies and uh, now he is a uh, registered veterinarian in canada and specialized in emergency critical care so dr vimal thank you very much for accepting our invitation and without okay. taking much time i would like to pass the forum to the uh, dr lakshika uh, dilukshi who is the moderator and uh, one of our executive committee member of the 75th esco of sri lanka veterinary association dr lakshika over to you thank you very much sir my dear doctors let me start with the valuable details of the today's speaker dr bimal tennakon completed his bachelor of veterinary medicine and animal sciences in university of peradeniya in 2008 and also he finished his internship before his move into canada in 2009 he completed his masters in 2012 in canada he has a vast experience over 8 years as a research assistant during that time dr bimal tennakon has finished the licensing exams and got a certified qualifications in canada thereafter in 2019 he started an internship at the veterinary specialty center of newfoundland and labrador after the successful completion of the internship dr bimal started his working as emergency and critical care veterinarian in that center this is over to you dr bimal tennakon to speak on the today's topic common emergencies in dogs and cats thank you thank you i'll share my screen first one second can you see the screen yes is it all good okay so good morning uh, everyone and uh, uh, it's almost 5 o'clock in the morning here <laughs> uh, uh my i'm bimal uh, tenakon and i'm working at work as a uh, emergency and critical care veterinarian uh, in a veterinary special center uh, uh first of all uh, uh, Thank, thank you very much uh, for Sugat and uh, uh, SLBA uh, committee uh, for inviting me and uh, arranging this uh, uh, webinar. And it's great to uh, share knowledge with the, uh, our colleagues, and uh, it's a great opportunity for me too. So in today's webinar, uh, we are going to discuss about uh, basic uh, idea about what is veterinary emergency medicine and uh, Uh, and then we trying to discuss about uh, some of common emergencies in dogs and cats and how we uh, manage and how how do we de deal with those uh, cases so veterinary emergency medicine is a specialized branch of veterinary medicine that focus on uh, immediate care and treatment of animals uh, that facing life threatening condition so ultimate goal of a uh, uh, veterinary emergency medicine is uh, ensure the best chance of recovery by uh, stabilizing the patient uh, at first so in terms of uh, veterinary emergency medicine uh, initial assessment or triaging is uh, the first most important thing and uh, when we triaging uh, patients uh, uh, we triage uh, in a uh, system wise uh, usually we triage uh, uh, respiratory system cardiovascular system uh, nervous system and uh, urogenital system when we evaluate those uh, uh, systems uh, overall we could get uh, uh, some sort of uh, idea what kind of uh, emergency that we are uh, looking at and uh, what are the initial responses that we should take 
So in a respiratory system, uh, when you evaluate a, a respiratory system, you're looking for a breathing pattern, like uh, is there any uh, dyspnea or uh, tachypnea or any signs of apnea, uh, then uh, you go for next step, like uh, you listen for the extruder or any upper airway respiratory, uh, upper airway sounds. And uh, any signs of respiratory distress, uh, any effort, any abdominal effort, uh, then uh, you can evaluate uh, the mucous membrane color uh, for any cyanosis uh, uh, that would indicate uh, the poor uh, oxygenation. And uh, after you uh, will do your exam, uh, distal exam kind of thing, and then you can uh, do the uh, lung auscultation that would give you a better idea. Is there any abnormal lung sound like a crackers, a wheezing sounds, or uh, any dull, decreasive sound, uh, dullness uh, in the lung field? So those uh, information together would give you, uh, would be able to uh, navigate you towards what kind of a respiratory emergency you're looking at either whether this is a pneumonia or this is a uh, congestive heart failure cases uh, case or whether this is an asthma case kind of thing. And uh, it's very uh, important to do that thorough physical examination at the beginning to get that idea. So then we move to uh, cardiovascular system. In cardiovascular system, basically we evaluate uh, uh, perfusion. In the perfusion wise, uh, we check for the uh, mucous membrane color and uh, capillary refill, refill time and heart rate and pulse quality and uh, body temperature. So together all those uh, information would give you a brief idea about uh, how uh, cardiovascular system work and whether uh, it's compensated, non-compensated or uh, whether it's uh, uh, adequate perfusion is happening. Then uh, we check uh, for uh, mentation, uh, whether animals are bright, alert, or dull, or altered mentation, or any signs of uh, uh, change in the pupil dilation, uh, anisocoria, or meiosis, uh, mitosis, uh, uh, like a pupil size, and uh, any uh, sudden paresis, uh, paralysis uh, that would help to. Uh, differentiate uh, in different uh, neurological conditions. And um, especially uh, in a male cat, uh, we uh, evaluate uh, uh, urinary system, uh, especially bladder size and quality because of it's a very common uh, emergency uh, to have uh, uh, urethral obstructed uh, male uh, animals. So uh, after uh, this uh, initial triage, uh, then uh, we start uh, uh, navigate our treatment towards uh, to stabilizing patient. And before I uh, go next step, uh, uh, this is a list of uh, uh, common emergencies that we seen uh, mostly in our clinics uh, that are published by uh, American Veterinary Medical Association. And there are uh, 13 uh, common uh, cases that we would see uh, day to day. Uh, profuse bleeding and uh, breathing uh, difficulties and uh, urethral obstruction and ocular injuries and uh, poison, uh, toxic, toxic cases like a poisoning and uh, seizure and uh, bone fracture and uh, animals can't get uh, uh, settled because of pain and uh, heat stress or heat stroke and uh, persistent uh, vomiting or diarrhea more than 24 hours and uh, anorexia uh, more than 24 hours or unconsciousness. Among these, all these, uh, uh, most of these images, uh, common emergencies, it would lead to, to the shock of patient that because of the most of the emergency cases that we uh, look at in, look in the clinic uh, is having some sort of shock situation. 
So uh, shock is defined as uh, inadequate uh, cellular energy production, that which may result uh, from inadequate delivery of energy substrate and or inability to utilize them. So that's a definition of uh, shock itself. And uh, there are few categories of shock. Hypervolumic shock, cardiogenic shock, uh, distributive shock, neurogenic shock, or obstructive shock. So in, if you read uh, five different books, uh, you can see five different types of uh, categorization of uh, these kinds of shocks. But uh, ultimately, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, how animals are getting uh, their perfusion state uh, compromise and what is the main cause. And uh, even we categorize uh, these five, these, uh, this way, in same animal, you would see two different type of shock. And um, in terms of hypovolemic shock, uh, this type of shock uh, more mainly be seen in animals uh, with uh, severe bleeding or severe uh, dehydrated, severely dehydrated animals. So that would uh, markedly decrease the uh, blood volume and that would cause the uh, hypovolemia and uh, hyperperfusion, like a low uh, blood supply to the uh, tissues. Second one uh, would be cardiogenic shock. Uh, that would be because of uh, the inability of uh, heart to if pump effectively, uh, and that uh, would lead, lead to inadequate uh, blood circulation. So that uh, inadequate blood circulation again that would be uh, decrease the tissue perfusion and uh, most common cases for a uh, co causes for a uh, cardiogenic shock uh, it would be congestive heart failure uh, arrhythmia or cardiomyopathy and uh, thirdly uh, it distributive shock also uh, considered as a, uh, one category in shock uh, it mainly happen uh, when there's a uh, systemic uh, anaphylaxis or septic shock kind of thing. Cases uh, you would see widespread uh, dilation of blood vessels. Because of uh, that uh, blood vessel dilation, it lead to decrease uh, blood pressure and uh, blood flow to the organ. Uh, that also lead to uh, uh, hypoperfusion and uh, Lastly, we discuss about obstructive shock uh, that caused by a physical obstruction that prevent blood flowing uh, properly to the certain part of the body. Uh, in case of uh, GDV, gastric dilatation of volvulus uh, or a uh, thromboembolism, uh, we would see the obstructive shock. As I said earlier, uh, all organ uh, if any organ or tissue in the uh, body is uh, rely on uh, adequate intravascular fluid space, uh, adequate perfusion. So that rely on uh, the dependent uh, proper oxygen delivery and nutrient delivery and removal of byproduct. So when there's a hyperperfusion happen, then there's no adequate uh, oxygen or nutrient delivery and no byproduct uh, removal from the tissue. Uh, that would uh, lead to uh, poor uh, metabolic status in the uh, tissues and they weren't able to do normal physiologic uh, activity. And uh, in terms of shock is a clinically described as a condition of patient with uh, global hypoperfusion reached to a certain yeah, level of... So regardless of uh, uh, sim uh, what kind of shock uh, uh, symptom of shock is uh, 
symptoms of shock are many uh, generally similar. So weakness, lethargy, and dull mentation is very common, uh, very common to see, and um, depend on the type of shock, you would see rapid or weak pulse, and uh, increase or decrease heart rate, uh, mostly pale gums, and cold extremities, and shallow or rapid breathing. So any uh, patient that you would see, uh, you believe that uh, that patient going through uh, any type of shock situation or he's in the critical state, uh, first of all, we, when he come to the clinic, uh, first we try to access, I, I, I try to get IV access. Uh, reason for that uh, is uh, when uh, animal uh, going through the, uh, any type of, uh, cardiogenic distributor or any uh, hypovolemic shock. Most of patient comes uh, to the clinic at the stage of uh, uh, compensatory stage. It means like uh, your body start to compensate and try to uh, increase the heart rate uh, and uh, try to maintain uh, vascular pressure. And uh, once it go to next stage, it decompensated position and you're losing uh, that vascular access because of it start losing uh, vascular pressure and it's very hard to get IV access uh, in really low uh, blood pressure animal. So it would be really important to get uh, IV access uh, as soon as possible when you get the animal because of uh, within next 20, 30 minutes, you would lose that uh, window and you may not be able to get uh, IV access uh, easily uh, as early. So after uh, you get IV access, uh, then you can draw a blood sample and start doing objective assessment. Basically, we check uh, uh, pack cell volume or hematocrit uh, with the total solid. That would give you indication about uh, whether animals anemic uh, or not, or animals dehydrated, uh, and th that kind of uh, uh, information. And lactate is a very important uh, parameter that if you could measure, uh, that gives you import, uh, in the, that's a very good indicator about uh, global uh, high global uh, tissue perfusion. And in terms of uh, hypoperfusion, lactate increase, and uh, also it could indicate uh, to evaluate your uh, treatment. And uh, oxygen saturation, blood pressure, uh, and ECG. ECG is a very uh, if you go to ECG, that's uh, really important to have that uh, cardiac rhythm uh, and uh, any arrhythmia. Uh, also, blood glucose level, important to rule out uh, any hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Like uh, in terms of uh, if you go to a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis and really dehydrated, and uh, if you don't know what is exactly going on, uh, you having uh, those uh, information at the, at the first stage, it's easy to navigate your treatment. It's similarly for the ionized calcium. Uh, sometimes you see the patient, would, you would see uh, animals seizing and uh, it would be idiopathic epilepsy or it could be a brain tumor or else it could be because of uh, uh, low blood glucose level or low uh, calcium. So if you know, uh, if animal getting having some sort of uh, deficiency, uh, low blood glucose or low calcium level at the beginning, then you can easily treat those patients. So it would be just so important to uh, uh, have those information at the beginning uh, before you start uh, navigate your treatment. Uh, if you got a facility, uh, you can do. Uh, abdominal uh, scan and a thoracic scan, a fast scan. So this is only focal assessment. You just look for uh, any fluid accumulation in the abdomen or any fluid in the pleural space or any fluid uh, around the uh, pericardial space or any, any major, major uh, abnormality. You're not going to do full abdominal ultrasound or echocardiogram here. 
you just look for the few details. So this is the uh, machine that we are using in our clinic. Uh, uh, it's an Epoch uh, machine. And uh, in this uh, uh, slide, you can take it to the uh, bedside uh, as a bedside uh, point of care uh, anal analyzer. You can take it to the patient and draw blood sample. And within uh, 30 seconds, you get uh, all this information. You can get the uh, blood pH level and uh, partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and uh, hemoglobin level, sodium, calcium, uh, uh, sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride uh, level in, with the iron, and glucose, lactate, and uh, creatine. So, in terms of if you have uh, really uh, dehydrated patient and uh, he's having a history of uh, polyuria, polydipsia. And when you do uh, your point of care, blood gas analyzer, an analysis, uh, your pH is low and you have uh, a high blood glucose level and you have a uh, increased creatine and uh, increased hemocrit level, uh, maybe, uh, high uh, potassium level that would indicate uh, this patient may having uh, diabetic ketoacidosis uh, then because of uh, the prolonged uh, acidosis in the patient it could be caused by uh, only uh, major four or five reasons and uh, within that, uh, that DKA is uh, one of the uh, factors then you know the low blood pH or maybe this is because of a, a DKA, because you have a low blood pH and a high blood glucose. Those kind of information having at the beginning really help to navigate your treatment. So in, uh, in terms of initial stabilization, uh, what we're looking at uh, the IV fluids, and pain medication, and uh, oxygen supplementation. So first of all, we any shock patient except uh, uh, cardiogenic shock patients. So we try to uh, restore effective uh, circulating blood volume uh, as uh, as soon as possible. So that would the uh, idea of that uh, in, increase the blood volume and improve the uh, perfusion. In uh, to do that. Uh, uh, we're using isotonic uh, polyionic uh, crystalloid, uh, uh, or say if you got uh, uh, sodium chloride, uh, that would be okay. But uh, PLA or LRS, that uh, uh, polyionic crystalloids, and uh, in dogs, uh, uh, our shock bolus volume is a uh, uh, shock dose uh, for dogs. It would be sixty to eighty mils per kilogram. For cat, it would be uh, 40 to 60 milliliter per kilogram. Uh, that's a total uh, shock bolus. Uh, we are only giving uh, one fourth of it. Uh, except for example, for dog, uh, you give uh, 15 mil per kilogram uh, shock bolus over 15 minutes. So after that shock bolus, uh, you assess your cardiovascular parameters, you check heart rate, blood pressure, pulse pressure, mucous membrane color, and uh, capillary refill time. So how do we uh, assess those uh, uh, parameters? So any patient, uh, hypovolemic patient that we're looking at uh, severely dehydrated uh, uh, dog after, uh, having, after having a diarrhea for a, a couple of days and vomiting for a couple of days. So that patient uh, would come to clinic uh, severely dehydrated. So because of the dehydration, uh, he's not it means that he's not having adequate blood volume uh, in circulation. So when there's a not adequate blood volume, uh, what is body start to compensate, but it got. So because of uh, low blood volume, heart start uh, pumping uh, uh, rapidly. It means like it increased the heart rate. 
So most of dehydrated patient that you would see, uh, it would get heart rate about for a dog, especially about 140. And uh, it would get low blood pressure because of the peripheral blood pressure uh, getting starting low, uh, body try to uh, pull all the direct the blood supply to the, uh, his ma its major organs. And mucous membrane color uh, would be pale and pulse pressure would be low because of the low blood pressure. And uh, capillary refill time would be prolonged. Uh, those are the indicator of this patient at the beginning uh, before you start the fluid resuscitation, uh, the patient in the shock situation. And uh, because of the low uh, blood volume, uh, that patient in the compensatory stage and uh, body start trying to keep it live by doing those uh, adjustments. So once you give a uh, fluid bolus, uh, your 15 mil per kilogram uh, fluid bolus over 15 minutes, then now that patient's getting uh, additional amount of uh, fluid volume and it's uh, blood volume getting expanded. So if it's a, based on the what stage this patient is in, patient in it start changing those uh, the initial physiological response, then it would start uh, decreasing the heart rate and you would see a uh, change of the mucous membrane color and you would see change of the capital refill time. And also you would start feeling more stronger pulse. So that means your uh, shock bolus is working. And uh, if you don't see any change of uh, these uh, main physical parameters, then you can you go for your next uh, shock bolus. You give another quarter uh, bolus, 15 mil per kilogram uh, over 15 minutes. Again, when you're giving uh, shock bolus, 15 mil per kilogram uh, bolus, you need to give it within certain time period. You don't give it over one hour because it no point of giving shock bolus with a long period of time. It need to be given within fifteen to twenty minutes. Next uh, uh, agent you can use uh, artificial colloid uh, uh, heta starch or dextran. Uh, mostly people using heta starch. Uh, for a dog, uh, you can give a uh, five milliliter per kilogram bolus. So, uh, what would call it, always you give a colloid uh, together with uh, your crystalloid because of the uh, idea of uh, giving colloid is it would do two things. It would draw most of the extra vascular uh, fluid into the uh, vascular system. And that in that way, it would increase the uh, blood volume. And also, it would retain your crystalloids. Then uh, it give a uh, enough window for a body to adjust its uh, physio physiological response. So, in point of fluid ad administration, when you have a uh, adequate uh, risk, when you feel you have adequate uh, uh, restoration of uh, uh, fluid, basically your heart rate would become to normal range and you have a the palpable uh, low speed pulse. So the reason I said the palpable low speed pulse means like if you don't have a blood pressure machine, uh, still you can use your uh, skills to have an idea about uh, uh, pulse pressure. Usually low speed pulse, uh, it absent uh, any patient uh, mean arterial pressure lower than 60, you can't feel those fetal parts. So any patient uh, you can, if you can feel it, it means uh, patients, uh, those fetal parts, uh, patients uh, mean arterial pressure above 60. Uh, it means uh, that's kind of baseline uh, you restore. Again, uh, no fluid therapy indicated for patient with cardiogenic shock. So that's why you do your initial assessment. If you see any patient with cyanotic uh, hyperventilating and patient with the crackers or heart murmur. So 
basically that's your uh, cardiac check shock patient and you deal with those patients uh, in different ways. So oxygen delivery uh, would be another important aspect of uh, when you're dealing uh, uh, any patient in a shock situation because of uh, uh, hyperperfusion would lead to hypoxia. And uh, additional uh, support of oxygen would improve the overall quality of uh, uh, perfusion. So hypoxia lead, would lead to, uh, again, increased heart rate and all change, change of the, all the other physiological uh, factors. And uh, flow by oxygen uh, supplementation is um, one of the main method that we would use for these patients because while you initially triaging or placing IV catheter and giving, uh, while you, you're giving the fluid bolus, you can give additional uh, oxygen supplementation that would help uh, and that would improve the quality of uh, perfusion and increase the uh, rate of recovery. And apart from uh, uh, flow by oxygen supplementation, there are many methods that you would use uh, to uh, supply oxygen. Um, in different methods, uh, you would reach a different level of uh, oxygen supplementation. Uh, in patient uh, in the room air, yeah, they getting like a 20% uh, oxygen because of our atmosphere oxygen uh, concentration is uh, 21%. Uh, by give, doing the flow by oxygen, you can reach it up to 25 to 40. And uh, other uh, easy way to do it, uh, having uh, oxygen hood, oxygen cage, Ox having oxygen, uh, Maintaining oxygen cage would be easier uh, in most of clinical uh, environment because of uh, you just need a uh, closed uh, fiberglass uh, containment and make sure uh, it got uh, good ventilation because of uh, uh, basically keep the uh, animal cool. Because when you put uh, animals in a uh, close uh, environment, uh, they would getting uh, really uh, warm. Uh, by using this uh, oxygen cage, you can reach uh, uh, oxygen saturation up to 6%. So you are uh, uh, feline patient. The cats are more benefited uh, to have uh, this kind of uh, uh, oxygen cages and uh, nasal oxygen lines uh, another uh, uh, are using uh, to deliver oxygen in the long term cases mostly and uh, if your patient is uh, really sick and in apnea, having a severe respiratory distress or apnea uh, you would you would use uh, uh, mechanical ventilation uh, by intubation So third uh, part of uh, uh, managing these uh, shock patients uh, is pain management. So pain management uh, is one of the critical aspect uh, of uh, managing not only shock patients, uh, any patient in the uh, veterinary uh, medicine. Because the pain, uh, having the animal with ongoing pain is, uh, first of all, it unnecessary unnecessary suffering, like uh, it not like uh, 30 years ago, like uh, it, everything is evolving and medicine is evolving. And now same way, the veterinary medicine evolved so far and it, uh, pain management is uh, one of the major aspect of uh, uh, treating patient uh, in modern uh, veterinary medicine. So that would uh, change the patient the overall behavior and uh, it would depress and uh, it may keep a uh, patient uh, recumbent prolonged. And uh, if animal painful, it won't able to breathe properly because of the pain, it can't take a good breath. 
And uh, because of uh, uh, excessive sympathetic stimulation and uh, it changed the catabolism and it would delay the wound healing and also uh, uh, immune suppression. Overall, uh, you weren't able to monitor patient uh, because of this uh, excessive pain that would uh, mask uh, all other clinical uh, findings. So how do you know a uh, patient in a pain? So it's uh, basically, if you go to uh, exact place, exact uh, lesion, uh, you would see uh, it's very painful when you uh, palpate that area. And uh, in the chronic cases, the animal would be having poor appetite and restless and dull and uh, lack of uh, activity. And uh, they would lick or uh, biting that painful area because of uh, self uh, mutilation. Uh, Vocalizing, uh, whining, gro uh, groaning, uh, they always uh, uh, start. You, you would see uh, animals not settling down. And uh, altered gait, it's uh, one of the main uh, indicators. You would animals go to kyphosis or different gait. And uh, abnormal posture, uh, they won't. Uh, Settle and reluctant to sleep, and uh, sometimes it would be very uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic behavior. Like uh, they would show aggression or less of uh, an increased affection. Like now we need to come and uh, get more affection, like uh, more attention from you. That kind of a change of behavior also would be indicator of uh, uh, pain, and uh, animal be not able to uh, do their day to day. Uh, activity uh, with with the pain. So pain management uh, is, uh, as I said earlier, pain man management has evolved so much, and it's not a, a single uh, use of pain medication. It's mostly now uh, multimodal uh, approach. It means like a, you, your energy cell, you try to control with uh, different levels. So for that, uh, we, most commonly we use uh, opioids, uh, uh, energy seek, and non-steroid uh, anti-inflammatory agents, and local uh, energy seek or anesthetic agent. Also ketamine uh, could use as a, a good pain medication and uh, metatomidine. I know in the uh, I, uh, earlier I went and chat with a uh, few of my uh, colleagues, and it's a there's a great difficulty in Sri Lanka to get those opioid uh, analgesic agents. But uh, I think uh, SBA or some uh, institute should take an initiative to make that uh, thing happen, and every clinic would get this uh, uh, opioid pain medication, and it's available. Uh, to access. So because of uh, it's a pain management, uh, if you have those uh, medication up uh, in hand, uh, uh, it's easy to deal with. And uh, rather than you, sometimes your patient would getting uh, recover and you would see good response within a couple of days rather than you drag that patient in the pain you know, for uh, two weeks. Uh, Time. So most commonly using you most commonly used uh, pain medications are morphine, uh, methadone, uh, buprenorphine. Uh, those are three main pain medication, and butrophenol we using in case of uh, uh, most of the anxiety and uh, breathing uh, control. Uh, anxiety and uh, breathing uh, difficulties. Uh, because of the bitrophenol not having major analgesic uh, effect, it's mostly uh, sedative effect uh, it contains. 
and uh, methadone is the number one uh, analgesic uh, effect in this list. So that's uh, mostly about uh, what we're looking at uh, in, in the emergency situation, uh, how do we deal with the, and uh, how do we approach uh, for the uh, emergency uh, cases. Uh, basically, uh, you do your initial uh, triaging and based on your initial triage, uh, you would uh, try to uh, increase the perfusion by giving uh, fluid bolus, uh, fluid resuscitation, or else uh, uh, giving oxygen supplementation and pain management. And that would be the first 24 hour uh, treatment and uh, that would give a uh, uh, next team to evaluate the patient and uh, then deal with uh, what is the underlying cause. In next uh, uh, few slides, uh, I would go through uh, more common cases that we see day to day uh, practice. And respiratory distress uh, in cats are uh, uh, one of the uh, most common case we see day to day. And uh, common causes for uh, respiratory distress uh, in cats are uh, upper respiratory tract uh, infection, uh, laryngeal neoplasia, or laryngeal infection, uh, or as a lower respiratory tract uh, disease, like a bronchial disease, basically uh, you're looking at uh, feline asthma or pneumonia feel an asthma. Then uh, lung parenchymal disease, uh, uh, it basically uh, pulmonary contusion, pulmonary edema, uh, pneumonia uh, in that way. And uh, plural space disease, uh, uh, plural effusion or pneumothorax, or else uh, thoracic wall or diaphragmatic hernia, uh, secondary to uh, uh, trauma. Again, most of these uh, causes you can uh, differentiate by uh, initial assessment. Uh, at the auscultation, you would see, you would hear a different uh, lung sound and you can feel, you can differentiate uh, all those things. In uh, upper respiratory tract infection, you would hear wheezing uh, sound mostly. <coughs> and uh, In asthma, basically wheezing sound and a prolonged expiratory phase. And uh, that's a main difference in a, a difference you see the asthma patient and a, a plural effusion patient, your expiratory phase. And heart disease, uh, you would hear uh, abnormal heart sound, basically a heart murmur or gallop sound and uh, crackers uh, in lung because of uh, pulmonary edema. And uh, again, plural effusion, uh, decreased breath sound and dullness uh, in the percussion is one of the main uh, findings. Uh, in pneumonia patient, you would hear crackers and increase uh, breath sound uh, because of the uh, parent lung, parent uh, lung space is gone. Among uh, the respiratory distress in a uh, feline patient is a feline asthma. One of the uh, feline asthma is a common uh, cause, cause that could cause uh, uh, respiratory distress. And it characterized by uh, inflammation and constriction of uh, airways uh, that would lead into breathing and uh, coughing. And uh, feline asthma, could happen in cats in all ages. and it, But uh, mainly we see this uh, condition in the middle-aged cats uh, in the urban environment. So feline asthma patient, uh, it would uh, present to you uh, 
uh, with the persistent cough, uh, especially after uh, physical activity and uh, labored breathing or open mouth breathing. And uh, animal would be having, would be breathe uh, rapid or shallow breathing, lethargy and uh, reduced appetite. And uh, it, the posture would be changed uh, because of the difficulty breathing. Main diagnostic tool for feeling asthma patient uh, is chest X-ray. And uh, you would see the lung changes. Uh, basically, you see these donuts uh, here. And uh, that would indicate thickening of uh, uh, bronchitis. And uh, based on your diagnostics, uh, you can uh, do your treatment. Uh, acute general treatment, basically, uh, these uh, asthma patient comes uh, in a crisis. Uh, any uh, cat come to the clinic uh, in crisis, uh, it means stressed out and open mouth breathing. Uh, we you don't we try to do minimal handling on those uh, patient. It means uh, try to give you some uh, give on those patient. You don't try to do all the things at once. First, give uh, those patient time to settle down. And uh, butyrophenol is a, a good medication to have to manage those patients because of a uh, butyrophenol able to uh, decrease the uh, anxiety level and uh, they would uh, calm down and uh, breathing uh, rate would be uh, getting to normal range. And uh, having a uh, Oxygen cage for those patients would be ideal. Uh, usually, what we do, we give a bitrophonol dose and put them in oxygen cage for a, uh, another uh, 30, 40 minutes. Within that frame, uh, his oxygenation getting improved and his breathing uh, rate and effort getting more settled. And once uh, your patient settled down, then you go for the uh, next diagnostic step. Don't try to do uh, x-rays or anything with the, those uh, open mouth breathing cat because of uh, having live patient in your table, uh, live patient on your table would be more important than a uh, dead patient having a uh, diagnostic x-ray. So next step would be, uh, next, next treatment option would be you can use the uh, uh, bronchodilators, if you got those at uh, uh, injection, or else you can use a uh, metered dose uh, inhalers, uh, albuterol uh, puffs. So once you having, once you stabilize the patient and then you do your diagnostic, then, then you send home those patients with the oral glucocorticoids, uh, basically prednisone, prednisolone, uh, one to two milligram per kilogram per hour um, every 24 hours. Uh, some uh, internal medicine specialists uh, recommend to give uh, prednisolone in the evening for cats. And uh, other thing is uh, you can send bronchodilators, uh, terbutylene, or theophylline, or aminophylline. Uh, also, uh, you can prescribe. Uh, uh, inhaler for those cats to use in a crisis. Plural effusion also a uh, common condition that cats would get uh, respiratory uh, distress. Uh, plural feline Plural effusion is condition characterized by abnormal accumulation of uh, fluid in a plural space, uh, the area between lungs and chest wall. Because of uh, extra accumulation of uh, fluid, the lungs couldn't uh, expand as it used to be, and uh, that would compress the lung field, and that would cause uh, respiratory distress and uh, difficulty breathing.
So clinical signs uh, for pleural effusion, again, the, you would see patient comes, labored breathing, dyspneic uh, and uh, shallow breathing, open mouth breathing. And uh, one thing very important to know, like uh, in, anytime when cat panting, that means uh, that animal is going through respiratory distress because they never pant. Uh, weakness or lethargy uh, because of uh, low oxygen, there uh, is oxygen exchange. Those are the main clinical signs you would see. Uh, causes that would cause uh, pleural effusion, congestive heart failure, uh, feline infectious peritonitis, or else cancer, uh, trauma, or uh, blood clotting disorder. As I mentioned my previous slide, the uh, easiest diagnos diagnostic way is a physical examination. You would hear very dull lung sound. And uh, these patients, you can, once uh, they stabilize, uh, you can try thoracic radiograph. In the thoracic radiograph, you would see uh, diminished, diminished lung field and uh, uh, efficient in these lines. And uh, if you go to uh, ultrasound, uh, you can try to do uh, thoracic focal assessment, uh, uh, TFAST. You would see uh, fluid accumulation in the pleural space. Or else, uh, uh, other thing you could do if you go, if you have a uh, respiratory distress cat, and you, if you certain that a uh, patient is having pleural effusion and if you don't have any other uh, diagnostic options uh, you can do thorax synthesis it could be both uh, diagnostic and therapeutic if you do thorax synthesis and if you go to fluid you can remove all the fluid and then cat would be 100 percent better than it comes in and again uh, it won't hurt uh, if there's no fluid, that won't hurt uh, much uh, trying to do it. Again, uh, for these patients, uh, to manage this patient, also having butrophenol would be uh, really handy in hand. Uh, you give uh, 0 0.2 to 0.4 milligram per kilogram butrophenol to uh, calm down and sedate those patients. Then you can uh, do thoracosynthesis. Uh, without much uh, effort. So next uh, couple of slides, I'll go through uh, another common emergency we see day to day. Uh, that's uh, one thing is acute vomiting. Uh, acute vomiting uh, is a common complaint like a maybe more than 50% uh, of uh, our emergency uh, patient would come with the complaint of uh, acute vomiting. Signalment may change the, your differential diagnosis. Basically, uh, your young laboratory retriever patient uh, would have foreign body ingestion more likely than uh, acute pancreatitis by uh, your uh, old uh, your shih tzu or middle-aged shih tzu dog would have uh, pancreatitis rather than having foreign body. Likewise, uh, uh, signal may change the uh, differential diagnosis. And uh, any patient uh, less than two months old and unvaccinated patient power viral infection would be most likely uh, differential diagnosis, uh, likely diagnosis for this patient. And uh, any patient having vomiting and diarrhea uh, less than two months, uh, first thing uh, should come to your mind, oh, this is power case. And then do treat that patient as a power puppy. At the beginning, then uh, start to do your diagnosis uh, based on that. So acute vomiting, 
thorough history is uh, very important in these patients. Uh, that would be able to determine uh, how long it's happening and whether it's a uh, real vomiting or regurgitation or is there any uh, retching, gagging or coughing present uh, associated with uh, vomiting because of uh, some dogs uh, after cough and uh, excessive coughing, they would start uh, throwing up. In that case, you would be able to differentiate uh, this is a kennel cough dog or trachea bronchitis dog. Uh, he is throwing up because of cough, if not the foreign body or some gastrointestinal disease, then you can treat for the cough. In a way, very important to get a, a proper uh, history. And uh, probable possible cause of uh, vomiting, like uh, if they have seen uh, any toxin injection or if they have I'm seen- I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could you please? If, if they've seen uh, uh, injection of a foreign material, such a thing, it's uh, very important to have uh, while you're getting the history. And uh, description of vomitus uh, also uh, very useful. Uh, vomitus that contain uh, fresh fresh or digested blood, uh, like a coffee ground that suggests uh, gastric ulceration. And uh, that could happen in a hemorrhagic gastroenteritis or uh, parvovirus infection. And uh, any patient with the vomiting and also patient going, having other uh, clinical signs like a polyurea, polydipsia and weight loss, that would uh, navigate is more than uh, just GI issue. It could be more systemic disease. So it's very important to get a thorough, uh, detailed uh, history. And once you've got the detailed history, then you can uh, uh, list your differential diagnosis. So vomiting could happen because of a uh, uh, primary digestive system cause or as other causes. Primary digestive uh, system cause uh, acute gastritis is main, uh, one of the common cause that could cause uh, acute vomiting. And uh, drug-induced and infectious disease, uh, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, gastric ulceration, and uh, in small intestinal foreign body obstruction or else uh, acute pancreatitis. Those are the main uh, intestinal causes uh, that could cause uh, vomiting and uh, other causes, uh, any uh, other causes that could cause vomiting, uh, acute uh, uh, hepatobiliary disease, uh, acute renal failure, uh, peritonitis. disease, or as uh, endocrine disease like uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, acute uh, uh, Addisonian crisis, and uh, vestibular disease also could cause acute vomiting. So uh, these uh, acute uh, vomiting patients, uh, you can do your diagnostics are based on the history and then you know uh, history and signalment. So you know which way you should direct your diagnostics. Uh, if you could do everything, that should be fine, but uh, based on uh, animal's age and uh, history, then you can focus uh, what is the most important uh, diagnostic. For me, uh, one year old, uh, dog having vomiting, uh, I would do abdominal radiograph uh, before doing blood work because of uh, that would be the most common case for this patient. And if uh, I got uh, eight year old uh, Chih Tzu having vomiting, I would do the uh, blood work because of uh, it more related to the metabolic cause rather than uh, obstruction. Likewise, you can navigate, uh, you, you can uh, do your diagnostic uh, based on 
your initial assessment. If you got, uh, you can do epoch analysis, uh, the electrolytes uh, change you would see. And uh, most of uh, gastric foreign body, gastric or uh, small intestinal foreign, gastrointestinal foreign body would cause uh, metabolic alkalosis because of losing uh, gastric uh, fluid and uh, would increase the uh, lactate. And uh, CBC and chemistry profile help to rule out hepatic, renal, or infectious cause associated with vomiting. And uh, abdominal radiograph, uh, make sure you take at least two views, the lateral and DB radiograph to rule out uh, gastric obstruction. Once you... Uh, once you go to a patient, uh, then you've done diagnostic and you then do, uh, once you've done the diagnostic, do the treatment based on those diagnostic uh, outcome. And uh, there are few mainstay treatment uh, for any uh, patient with the acute vomit. So if it's a gastrointer uh, gastroenteritis or uh, any hepatobiliary disease or any other condition except the GI foreign, gastrointestinal foreign body, our main uh, stay, uh, main treatment stream is a fluid treatment and anti-emetic gastroprotectant and pain medication. That supportive care would improve the hydration status and uh, would uh, make patient feel better by having anti nausea medication and uh, it would improve the uh, clinical outcome. So fluid treatment, uh, basically fluid treatment, uh, what we're trying to do, we try to replace the fluid loss, dehydration, and uh, give the maintenance fluid supplementation within 24 hours. And uh, fluid bolus, uh, you can use fluid bolus, as I mentioned earlier, if animal really dehydrated. Uh, Anti-emetic uh, medication, uh, serenia or on dansterone, you can use. Uh, usually we don't use the metapropamide at the beginning uh, till you rule out the uh, GI foreign body because of a prokinetic drug can cause increased uh, GI uh, motility and uh, increase the perfusion. Uh, uh, in increase the uh, perforation. Uh, for for that reason, I would uh, avoid the metacopramide at the beginning. And uh, famotidine and uh, pantoprazole or omeprazole, uh, based on the availability as a gastroprotectant, uh, because of because uh, most of these patients would be would come with because of a uh, basic gastritis and uh, those are the medication you could use and uh, pain medication is really important for the patient uh, who's having pancreatitis or really bad uh, uh, diarrhea uh, because of uh, diarrhea they would get uh, abdominal pain um, buprenorphine or gabapentin you could use for these patients uh, i would avoid uh, NSAIDs and uh, any uh, steroid in these patients. Uh, for obvious reason, NSAIDs can increase the uh, gastric ulceration, it decreases the mesenteric blood flow, and uh, it, overall it decreases, uh, it uh, makes it condition poor. And I would use avoid uh, NSAIDs and steroids in these patients. And in terms of uh, uh, gastrointestinal foreign body, uh, you would do exploratory laparotomy if radiograph indicated. So usually these patients uh, would recover within 24 to 48 hours and uh, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis that patients uh, having really bad uh, 
uh, diarrhea with the, uh, really bad, bad bloody diarrhea. They would develop uh, DIC because of uh, severe uh, dehydration and it would increase the uh, vascular blood viscosity and that uh, lead to uh, DIC. And uh, same way, uh, pancreatitis dogs uh, usually recover with well with the aggressive treatment. Uh, if you don't uh, treat aggressively with the fluid and uh, other medications, uh, those patients could cause uh, uh, SIRS. And uh, that's one reason you should treat those patients aggressively at the beginning and uh, do your diagnostic uh, proper way. And uh, one thing I want to go through uh, here, uh, regardless of uh, fluid treatment. So always, uh, you have, if you go to a facility to do fluid treatment uh, in hospital, uh, try to do it uh, in calculated manner. So try to replace the fluid deficit and also meantime you give a fluid requirement. So this equation would give you an idea of how you calculate fluid deficit. And uh, this is the equation uh, for the uh, daily fluid uh, requirement. So you uh, add these two together when you're giving uh, fluid treatment. So I think uh, that's most of it for today. And uh, in this slide, I put uh, some of the uh, really great resources that you could use. Uh, most of them are really free. And uh, please respect me practitioner and clinician brief, uh, free resources you can use. And let's see, I would like to thank uh, my workplace uh, and uh, SLBA uh, for uh, this opportunity. Thank you. So the floor is open for the questions. You can ask questions or simply you can type the question in the chat box. And we have some questions in the chat box. Dr. Bimal, you can discuss those questions. So, Excuse me, doctor. Yeah. Yes, good afternoon and uh, thank you. I mean, very helpful lecture. So I just had one question. These uh, puppies and uh, kittens who come with parvo. So uh, would you, and we have to, after doing a thorough assessment, we know that they are anemic as well and a lot of things are going out. It's uh, incontrollable. And they are also going into uh, shock because low body volume, I mean, blood volume. So what, what is the first line of fluid which you would, you would prefer? So for the uh, power patient, uh, if you have a, a PLA plasma light, uh, that would be uh, really helpful because of it contain uh, most of electrolyte and uh, it doesn't change the blood pH much. And those power patients uh, come metabolic uh, acidosis, right? So when you give uh, the sodium chloride, uh, that would not much helpful. And uh, instead of sodium chloride, uh, if you can go with the uh, PLA or uh, LRS, that would be more better. And uh, also power patient, uh, those are less than two month old puppies, right? So when you see the puppies, they don't have uh, excess uh, glucose storage and they would go hypoglycemia really quickly. And uh, with your fluid uh, supplying 2.5% uh, dextrose uh, solution, uh, that also would improve the outcome. So can we have a mixture of, can we prepare like for fluid of D, D25 because they are extremely hypoglycemic and that can cause neurological symptoms and LRS, like that, that is a poly polyionic solution, right? Yeah. So uh, you can uh, mix uh, LRS and uh, uh, dextrose, right? So, so you are, so, uh, 
solution that you uh, infusing in infusion solution would be uh, 2.5% take cross solution that, that in LRS. So given uh, B vitamin, I don't see much of uh, important in that uh, uh, B vitamin in the puppies at this point because of uh, it won't change the outcome. But uh, given the uh, deck cross because of this uh, hypoglycemic puppies, uh, it would increase the uh, uh, survivability. Also in my practice, I make sure I tell them that at least for the next uh, seven days or something, it's a critical period and puppies go home and then they try to play and all that and immediately there's a collapse because energy is spent. So that aspects also, if you can just throw some light because that is very much needed that the complete rest is needed and not much activity. What do you have to say about that? So it could be because of uh, uh, they might... Uh, in the uh, hyperchloroquinol state, right? Still, and uh, yes. they would throw blood clot or something like that. And uh, yes, uh, once puppy gone home, uh, resting would be more important, and uh, that's something you must need to do with the client education, right? So because of we can't, uh, and it's not in our control. If once puppy gone home, that's up to owner going through those uh, steps. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Bimal, uh, yeah. from Dr. Veera Surya, there's a question. What are the drugs we can give to introduce vomit in case of poisoning? Uh, here we are using uh, uh, apomorphine. And there's a morphine derivative when uh, we use uh, 0 0.03 milligram per kilogram uh, dosage for dogs. For cats, uh, you can use uh, psilocin or dex uh, Dex storm be using eight microgram per kilogram. Uh, for cats, it's uh, not, uh, it's a hit and miss for cats, right? Like a, it's uh, like a 60 to 65 percent of cats uh, they would uh, throw up, but uh, for dogs uh, you give you can give a uh, apomorphine, and 95 percent of time they would throw up. Okay, the second question: What's your experience on recovering cats after getting cat flu, feline calciviral infection of upper respiratory tract? Uh, feline upper respiratory tract uh, infection, the, it's treating URI cats is very, uh, very frustrating because of uh, other complications too. But uh, at the beginning, initially, uh, if you give a uh, good hydration and send home with the uh, proper uh, instruction with proper care, most of them uh, would recover, but uh, recurrence would happen. And uh, he, uh, increase the humidity in the environment. That's uh, uh, one thing you could do. And uh, by uh, providing nebulization and uh, owners could uh, clean uh, animal and uh, also give a uh, nutritious food. Um, those are the basically uh, basic care would improve the outcome, but uh, I know it's a, a pretty frustrating cases to handle. Next one, in shock, in cat, is it bradycardia or trachycardia and body warming in cat is beneficial? Thank you for asking that question. It's, a, it's really important. I, I think I uh, mostly uh, went through the dog uh, uh, shock situation. Uh, yes, uh, cats come in shock uh, bradycardia and uh, uh, they come uh, their heart rates low and uh, body temperatures low so uh, that gives you indicator that's an indicator of cat in shock situation and uh, when you give a fluid treatment for those cats to increase the blood pressure uh, it's a uh, very important to increase 
the body temperature in same time because of uh, because uh, uh, cats better receptors stop working when body temperature is uh, lower than uh, 36.5 so it doesn't matter you give how much volume to this cat and uh, if your better receptor is not working and uh, you need to uh, warm up the patient once they increase uh, temp body temperature it start uh, uh, putting uh, some to start to regulate their blood pressure uh, yes uh, uh, cats come uh, bradycardic and uh, hypothermic uh, uh, when they show what happened if fluid overload given to power affected puppies does it cause death it could happen, yes, uh, but uh, you, those uh, uh, power puppies, you need to give a, a fluid treatment because of uh, that's a, a main straight treatment. And uh, you could calculate a, a fluid requirement for the puppies. And uh, especially for a less than three month old puppies, uh, fluid requirement is a uh, Really high. It's not. It more than uh, resting energy requirement in the uh, adult dog. Uh, puppy uh, fluid requirement is uh, very high, and uh, it's pretty hard to uh, do the fluid overloading for the puppies because of uh, unless you open your bag and uh, let it flow through. Uh, it's very difficult to fluid overload those uh, puppies and make sure that uh, you can give at least uh, three or four times, three times maintains a uh, uh, fluid dose uh, for uh, puppies less than uh, three months old. Please elaborate on the time gap between accidental ingestion of toxic material and inducing emesis in cats and dogs. It's based on uh, what, what is the toxicity, right? So uh, sometimes uh, some toxins, uh, they would absorb within first one hour. And uh, after that, uh, you mostly uh, rely on uh, activated charcoal. And uh, in this vomiting, uh, you could do up to uh, four, five hours after even. Uh, in terms of uh, socks or some uh, material, uh, you can do try to induce something uh, even after uh, four or five hours. Please explain regarding vasoconstructive agents using distributive shock. For a distributive shock, uh, vasoconstructive agent. Uh, Number one uh, agent we would use uh, dopamine. You can start with uh, uh, five microgram uh, per kilogram uh, per hour rate, right? and you increase the uh, dosage uh, according to the response. And the same way, you can try to back it back. Uh, that's a uh, continuous rate infusion CRI setup. Uh, Again, if you're using for a cat, uh, you need to warm up those patient because of giving dopamine or any uh, vasoconstrictive agent uh, won't affect those uh, hypothermic cats. Uh, in a dog's uh, dopamine would be the uh, first line of uh, drug. How many days do we need to give activated charcoal? Activated charcoal. Uh, Again, it's uh, depend on uh, what is the toxicity. And uh, very recently, uh, some of the uh, poison control uh, consultation, they suggested uh, sometimes uh, you don't need to give active charcoal for chocolate toxicity. And some people say give uh, three doses. And uh, uh, 
again, when you give back to the chapel, uh, you need to think about uh, their hydration status because an uh, active chapel uh, would dehydrate those patients and uh, decrease the sodium level. And uh, it's very important to give active charcoal under your supervision. And unless uh, you can't see those patients, I would give a, a couple of doses and then see the response. Most of the uh, time uh, cases, they say uh, three doses at least. And I think it's time to wind up the session. Before winding up the today's very successful webinar, I cordially invite Dr. Kaundika Vanigasundara, the Secretary of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, to give the vote of thanks. Dr. Kaundika, please uh, unmute. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dilrukshi. Uh, I think we have uh, completed a very successful uh, webinar today. Uh, in fact, this is the third international webinar series uh, organized by uh, Sri Lanka Webinar Association. Uh, over uh, 75 number of participants have joined uh, for today's uh, webinar through Zoom platform. And some have joined through uh, our SLVA YouTube channel as well. Uh, so uh, it went almost one and a half hours and most of the participants were uh, till there, uh, till now. So that shows the interest in nature of the presentation today. So on behalf of uh, Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Vibal Tendrakorn, the Emergency and Critical Care Veterinarian, uh, Veterinary Specialty Center of uh, Newfoundland and uh, Labrador in Canada for accepting our invitation and conducting an excellent presentation today uh, on common emergencies in dogs and cats. And it was a very informative presentation uh, along with a lot of uh, interesting practical aspects uh, on common emergencies in dogs and cats. Uh, I'm sure all the participants must have gained a lot uh, from your presentation to improve their knowledge on this subject. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bimal, uh, once again for your valuable contribution. Thanks. And it is my duty uh, to thank uh, our moderator uh, Dr. A.M.L. Dilrukshi, uh, our executive committee member of SLBA, for doing a wonderful job. Uh, further, I must thank uh, Dr. Sudak Premachandra, our vice president of SLBA, for making all the arrangements for today's successful webinar. Uh, last uh, but not least, I must thank all the participants who have joined today uh, for today's webinar from different parts of Sri Lanka and also from overseas, uh, despite of their busy schedules. Uh, for your benefit, uh, I must say that uh, the recording of this today's webinar is uploaded, uh, uh, will be uploaded shortly uh, to YouTube uh, to catch the action later if you miss any. Uh, then uh, we'll have our next webinar on 6th August uh, at the same time on burnout and compassion fatigue among uh, veterinary professionals. Uh, I'm sure you will join for that as well. So until we meet from our next webinar, it is goodbye to you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay, the webinar is over. Have a nice day. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.